first of all, thank you again. We'll be doing this every Friday night at 8 p.m. We try to make these topics fun and interesting. Today's topic is the greatest wine crimes of all time. I think this will be a fun uh, talk. Um, get a glass of wine if you haven't already gotten one. That's going to be really important. So also just want to give you a heads up and preview of what we have coming up. Really excited next Friday evening. Carolyn from our Breckenridge Tasting Room will be leading a talk on Australian wines. If you haven't met Carolyn, she's one of our great uh, ambassadors in the tasting room. You can recognize her instantly by her Australian accent and she'll be telling us all about what makes Aussie wines wonderful. So before we get started with our first story, I have to change our background here to put you into the, uh, the right mood, I think. So give me just a second to do that. Uh, because for this first story, we're going to go, yes, I think we'll go here. We're going to go to Burgundy. Um, so welcome to Burgundy in France. This is in Burgundy, by far and away, the most famous Grand Cru winery is a winery called Domandie de la Romanie Conti, called DRC for short in wine speak. So if you ever hear anybody talking about DRC wine, they are talking about wines from Domaine de la Romanie Conti. Um, now, I think as the owner of Continental Divide that it's pretty cool that we were established in 2016 and we've made some pretty great wines in our first three and a half years, but we really cannot hold a candle to Domaine de la Romanie Conti because DRC was founded in 1232, the year 1232 in the Middle Ages. That's even before like the Black Death, I mean, this is way back in history. They've been making wine in this particular little 4.8 acre vineyard in the Burgundy area of France for almost 900 years. This winery produces only 5,980 bottles a year. Um, it's a place where time truly stands still. It's why I like the photograph that I have behind me because I think it gives a good sense. I mean, these. The countryside of Burgundy is these tiny little villages where everybody knows everybody. Everybody produces wine the same way they have for centuries. Um, it's really a place where time stands still. They still till the soil at the DRC with horse-drawn plows. And it's a place where the vines have been lovingly cared for by the same two families for centuries. Our story focuses on the grand master and co-owner of the state, Monsieur Albert de la Villeraine. And the story starts shortly after Christmas in 2009. And before I go further, we do have a little guest star that's coming into uh, my lecture room here. Come on over here, Scout. Scout misses seeing all of her friends in the tasting room. So she wanted to come and say hello to everybody. So this is Scout, our official winery dog, if you haven't met her yet. She's a Bernese Mountain Dog. You might have remembered her this last summer when she was a tiny puppy. Hi, Scout. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> so that was Scout. Okay. So where were we? Christmas 2009, Mr. Deliverane returns home after a uh, Christmas dinner. And when he gets home, he discovers on his doorstep of his little house an envelope. Seems very strange to be getting a... Uh, a correspondence on Christmas, but he opens it up and inside to his amazement is a absolutely meticulous map of his vineyard, of the Domain's vineyard. And what's truly amazing is that this map is hand-drawn and of such high quality that it far surpasses any map that the Domain has of its own vineyard. In fact, it shows each of the 20,000 vines individually and precisely within a square foot of where it is located. It accurately depicts every path through the vineyard. It accurately depicts where the fences are. Um, and as he sees this and wonders who must have taken the time for clearly, this must have taken months of painstaking work for someone to survey, there is a note. He opens the note and the note simply reads, I know your vineyard. And to prove that the writer of the note knows the vineyard, he points to a small little circle on the map and says, if you look here, there is a minor defect in one of the vines. You will hear from me. That's all it says. 
Monsieur de la Varenne doesn't quite know what to make of this, but certainly he's curious. So the next morning he gets up with the sun, drives out to the vineyard. The vineyard is unprotected. It's surrounded by a two and a half foot tall stone fence that's been there since the 1200s. He walks out into it with the map in his hands and finds the spot marked. And sure enough, there is one vine that is missing exactly in the spot where the map showed it to be. Well, Mr. de Lavrain, who was curious, but he wasn't concerned. Um, he certainly was anxious to know how someone had gotten access to his vineyard for all of the time it must have taken to do this, but there didn't seem to be anything nefarious about the note. And so he went about his uh, regular business and enjoyed the remainder of the, the Christmas and New Year's holiday. Although throughout the time, it did weigh on him that not only had somebody studied his vineyard, but they clearly had spent an immense amount of time in the vineyard. And that truly, truly gave him just a mild thought of concern in the back of his mind. But a few weeks later, everything changed. He comes home from a late evening dinner party and finds another note on his doorstep. And his idyllic life of the Burgundian countryside fractured before his eyes. For in this note, there is again a hand-drawn, meticulously drawn, incredibly detailed and accurate drawing of his vineyard. But this time there are ominous crop circles drawn all through the vineyard, circle, 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 overlapping each other. And Monsieur de Lavarain remembers that he has seen maps like this during the phylloxera plague that plagued France's vineyards about 40 or 50 years earlier. Phylloxera is a plague of vines. It's a disease that affects vines that ruined almost all the vineyards of France. His was one of the very few vineyards that was actually spared. Phylloxera means destroyer of vines. That's what the name of the, of the uh, disease is. And it also, by the way, affected the Napa Valley and destroyed all of Napa's vines. Napa saved France by sending cuttings of their vines to the famous chateaus of France to get them restarted again. And then when the plague hit Napa some 20 or 30 years later, the French vineyards uh, reciprocated the favor. So he sees this map, but he's very concerned because phylloxera has been gone in France for, for decades. There's no sign of phylloxera in France. And besides, his vineyard is so magical, it escaped the plague the last time. This cannot be. But this time, there is another note with the map, and this note is far more ominous. This note tells him that the writer of the note has poisoned his vines with a plague. The writer tells him that he has drilled holes into the rootstock below the soil where he will never find it, carefully filled the holes with this invisible plague that will kill the vines, then meticulously filled each little drilled hole and painted the outside so as to be invisible to the naked eye. He tells Mr. de Lavrain that come the spring, when the vines awaken and the sap starts flowing through the vines, that will spread the disease throughout the vine. And once it's in one vine, that vine will spread it to all the vines within a certain circumference, much the way phylloxera spread and wiped out entire vineyards within two or three years. The note does not tell him what the plague is. It leaves that as a mystery, and it doesn't tell him why he did it, but simply says, you will hear from me. But the note does give one other piece of information. To ensure that Mr. de Lavarain takes this seriously, he tells him that two of the 20,000 vines in the vineyard have had these holes drilled above the soil line where he can find them and marked with tape so that he can come and see what has been done to his vines because he'll never be able to find the underground ones somewhere in the roots of all of his other ones. It says that it took a team of six people, six entire nights working throughout the night to do this. And he tells him on the map which two specific vines he has done this to above the soil so that Mr. de Lavarain can actually see for himself that his vines have in fact been uh, inflicted with some ghastly plague, and it tells him, you will hear from me again. So the next morning, Mr. de Lavarain gets up even before sunrise this time. He rushes out to the vineyard, finds the two vines that are, that are noted there, and sure enough, 
he can see just above the soil, about an inch and a half above the soil, there is a tiny little drill hole in the, uh, in the root stock of each of them. And it appears to have then been filled with a wood putty and painted over. But he can find it because they are marked with pieces of tape. He realizes if this tape were not there, he never would be able to see this uh, on a vine. I mean, it, it is meticulous. He doesn't know what to do. He calls a meeting of all of his most trusted employees who would have done this. Why would anybody have done this? They cannot figure it out. And soon enough, a third note arrived telling him that if he does not pay a ransom of a million euros, his vines will die. But if he pays the ransom of a million euros prior to the spring thaw, when the sap begins flowing through the vines, he can save his vines. And more terrifying, perhaps most terrifying of all, the writer tells Mr. Deliverain the exact date when his vines awakened the year before, showing that this person had not only been in his vineyard this year to draw these maps and to do this dastardly deed, but had been in the vineyard the last year or perhaps for more than a year. Well, Mr. De Liverain is terrified, but he tries to solve the problem first privately and quietly. The last thing he wants to do is destroy the reputation of what is universally seen as one of the premier chateaus of France. He calls his staff, they try to solve the problem, they cannot figure it out, they cannot figure out who would have done it, they cannot figure out why it is done. His business partner urges him, you must call the gendarme, the local police, we must get them involved. But Mr. de Lorraine decides, no, no, I want to try to see if we can figure this out privately. And so he brings in a professor from the University of Bordeaux, who he's been friends with for more than 20 years. Periodically, he would bring this professor into his vineyard to talk about some new technique or learn what, uh, you know, what the university was studying with regard to the vines. And fortunately for Mr. de Lorraine, Every year at Christmas, he had given this professor a bottle of his amazing wine. And by the way, these bottles of wine from the DMC have sold for up to $130,000 for a single bottle. The current vintage typically sells for ten dollars to $30,000 per bottle. That's how much this wine is prized in France. Well, he tells the professor, I need your help. Please come. And the professor comes and comes the next day. And they look at the vines. The professor agrees to take the vine. He studies it at his lab. And he calls Mr. De Liveron with the sad news. The vine is dying, and I don't know why. I cannot figure out what disease it has. Mr. De Liveron, in frustration and finally panic, less than two weeks left before his vines awaken, calls the national police the French version of the FBI. They send nearly a thousand agents flooding the tiny little village trying to find uh, what has happened. And the next thing that happens is Mr. De Liverain gets a note via the French version of Federal Express that tells him that he must pay the million euros in cash in a duffel bag and draws again another map and gives him a particular spot in the vineyard where he must drop the duffel bag of cash at exactly midnight. It is the next night that he is supposed to do this. The police tell him they can have people watching the vineyard, but they cannot possibly get ready in one night to uh, have a full surrounding cordon around the vineyard, all undercover, all undetectable in this sleepy little town. So it is agreed that he will pay 100,000 euros in the duffel bag and will write a note explaining that he needs more than 24 hours to get the rest of the cash. On February 22nd, on February, for, for, pardon me, on February 20th, he goes into the vineyard. He drives into the vineyard with the duffel bag of cash. The police are surrounding the vineyard. They are watching through telescopes. It's a foggy, rainy night. He drops the bag of cash right next to the vine that's designated, and he drives away, and nothing happens. The police watch, and they watch, and they watch, and nobody comes to the vineyard. But when the sun rises and the police enter the vineyard to retrieve the duffel bag, it is gone. 
Now we fast forward three days later, he gets another note telling him, you now have 48 hours to give me the remaining 900,000 euro, again in cash, again in a duffel bag, again in the same spot. The French police give him cash, counterfeit cash that they have actually uh, collected from another sting operation. He puts it in the duffel bag and this time, one of the French police officers ties himself to the undercarriage of the car. And his theory is that as the car comes into the vineyard, stops to drop off the bag, the police officer will roll out of the bottom of the car and hide between two of the vines so he can watch the duffel bag. And he does this. And the police officer watches and he watches and it's again a rainy, stormy night. And suddenly, right before the police officer's eyes, the bag disappears. One second it's there, one second it's gone. Nobody has entered the vineyard. It's magically gone. The police officer shouts into his radio, the entire army of police come rushing in and what do they discover? But hidden below the ground of the vineyard is a 10 foot by eight foot cave that a man has been living in for two and a half years as he has studied the vineyard. And all he had to do to get the bag of cash was reach his hand out of the fake ground that he had built above his cave. It was a piece of wood with a little bit of dirt on top of it. Pulls the duffel bag and pulls it into his lair. The man is arrested. Um, Mr. de la Varenne insists that before the police can question him, he must have the right to come in and talk to the man. He must beg him to give him the antidote. This is a national treasure of France. It cannot be destroyed. The police agree, Mr. de la goes into the prison cell, interviews the man and says, Mr. de is crying, you must tell me, he's sobbing. You cannot let these vines grow. He tries to explain to the man the importance of these vines to France. And the man says, Mr. de la I would never kill the vines. I'm a vigneron, I studied winemaking. I may have had a bad life, I may have turned to a life of crime, but I would never do that. Only two of your vines have actually been infected. It's the first two that you found. The rest of it was all just a ruse to get you to pay the money. Mr. de la later finds out that he actually killed them not with a plague, but with a Roundup, the weed killer that we use to kill weeds in our lawn, which is why the professor couldn't figure out what disease it was, because it was no disease. Uh, if you like this story, by the way, this has been turned into a great book. It's called Shadows in the Vineyard, The True Story and Plot to Poison the World's Greatest Wine by Maximilian Porter. Uh, and you can uh, find that on Amazon if you want to check out that book. By the way, if you're looking for a great wine to drink while you're reading it, Pinot Noir is, of course, the way to go. So we now turn to our second crime. Most people think that this story starts in Napa in October of 2005 when a massive fire broke out the, at the Wines Central Warehouse in Vallejo, California, just outside of Napa. Within hours, the flames had destroyed four and a half million bottles of California's finest wine worth more than $250 million, making it the single largest destruction of wine in world history. Worse yet, arson investigators determined that the fire had been deliberately set. Amongst the priceless bottles destroyed were 175 bottles of Francis Dinkelspiel's original wines from his great-great-grandfather's vineyard in California, the first vineyard ever created in the Napa Valley in 1875. But the real story begins much earlier. You see, in 1998, a popular and local character named Mark Anderson opened a place in Sausalito, a very tony very expensive waterfront area in Marin County overlooking the Golden Gate Bridge. He opened up a wine storage business. He was trusted. He was well known. He was actually a city councilman. And many of Napa's most um, prominent families chose to store their wines um, with Mark Anderson's business Sausalito Cellars. An early customer was Samuel Malisk. He was a South San Francisco restaurant owner whose restaurant had gone bankrupt. It was one of the best restaurants in San Francisco. And he sent 756 cases of the restaurant's finest wines to be held there until the courts could determine ownership. Many, many cult wines worth 
thousands of dollars a bottle. Well, a representative of Christie's Auction House came to retrieve Mr. Moskalisk's wine for auction. More than 5,700 bottles worth $648,000 turned out to be missing. Mr. Anderson insisted it was all just a misunderstanding. They had never been delivered to him. It must have uh, been the fault of the delivery company. But the police filed embezzlement charges against Mr. Anderson in February of 2004. But strangely, they didn't publicize his arrest. They didn't publicize that he was being charged. Many people have questioned if this was because of his city connections. Remember, he had been a city councilman there. And over the next year, while awaiting trial, multiple other customers began talking about expensive wines that were missing from Mr. Anderson's shop. One bottle that was missing was a famed 1969 bottle of Lafitte Rothschild worth $29,000. If you're a James Bond fan, that's the wine that Bond prefers to drink. Um, and another customer of his was Ron Lassiter, an avid collector who had a great nose for wine. He collected cult wines from Napa. He kept getting excuse after excuse after excuse from Mr. Anderson about where his wines were. And when finally Mr. Anderson turned over his wines to Ron Lassiter, Lassiter tasted them and immediately recognized something was wrong. The wines in the bottle were not the wines that he had given to Mr. Anderson to store. In fact, Mr. Lassiter's fine nose actually thought he knew what the wine was. He thought instead of the $450 bottle of Sinquanon, which he had just opened, that this tasted remarkably like two buck chuck from Trader Joe's supermarket. So he actually set out to have the wine DNA tested and sure enough, his wine had been drained from the bottle and two buck chuck had been poured into it. Federal prosecutors later figured out that Anderson, instead of storing his client's wines, had sold over a million dollars of wines at various auction houses around the country. In 2003, he was evicted from his Sausalito store, but he was born again. He moved his client's wines to Wine Central, a massive bunker in the decommissioned Mare Island Naval Shipyard in Vallejo. The warehouse, which had once been used to repair nuclear submarines, had concrete floors and concrete walls that were three feet thick, perfect for maintaining perfect temperature of wines, and he stored his wines there. Mr. Anderson just sublet a little small 2,500 square foot space surrounded by a chain link fence inside the massive warehouse. And in 2005, he was finally served with eviction notices from Wine Central. They got tired of the fact that he wasn't paying his rent and customers kept coming complaining that they were missing wines that he was supposed to be stored for them. And one day before he was supposed to be evicted, the fire came. Uh, police later charged him with arson. In searching his computer back home, they discovered that a week before the fire, he had visited various websites on how to make a bomb with a cell phone trigger. He managed to delay the trial through legal maneuvering for almost six years. But in February of 2012, he was finally convicted. He was sentenced to 27 years in prison and ordered to pay restitution of $70.3 million dollars which I understand he is not surprisingly not paid. This has also been turned into a great book. So if you're looking for something else to do during our, uh, our time of forced social separation, this book is called Tangled Vines, Greed, Murder, Obsession, and an, Ar and an Arsonist in the Vineyards of California, written by Francis Dinkelspiel. It would be a great uh, book to read with a bottle of our reserve Napa Cabernet, the artist series. Again, Order it online at breckwinery.com and you can get free shipping with the code free ship, capital F, capital S, no space in the middle. And lastly, I wanna leave you with the third and final crime. This one's actually much more recent. It only happened a few years ago. Um, it happened in the Napa Valley. It's a business deal right out of a Hollywood movie that went horribly wrong. An investor in an Napa winery ponied up $800,000 in cash in order to make his dream of becoming famous in the wine business come true, what he didn't realize was he was investing in his own murder. The story starts with two unlikely business partners. Mr. Dahl, an entrepreneur drawn to, the, drawn to the glamour of the Napa Valley wine scene, dreamed of being a winemaker. And Mr. Toffolis, a wealthy Silicon Valley businessman who was willing to turn over his nest egg, including over a million dollars in a gym bag, 
to an entrepreneur with big dreams. Well, how do you get from two ambitious guys trying to make it in the wine business to a murder mystery? In 2008, Robert Dald leaves Minnesota where he had a decidedly unglamorous mold removal business. He comes to Napa and through force of his own personality and, and gregariousness, he becomes a local sort of celebrity in, in town. He starts as a broker buying and selling grapes, kind of the lowest position in the, the wine industry hierarchy, but he dreamed of becoming a famous winemaker. Next, he founded California Shiners, a company that would buy wines made by other wineries, blend them to a unique formula, and then sell them in blank bottles without a label that other wineries would purchase. Well, after doing this for a couple of years, um, he met a winemaker in Napa called Dominique Fapoli. Dominique Fapoli actually had a very successful small Napa Valley winery, but Dominique was one of the very first Napa Valley vintners to open to the idea of selling wine to the Chinese market. And he quickly learned that the Chinese wanted far more of his wine than he could produce, and Robert Dahl was the perfect business partner because Robert Dahl could sell him literally hundreds of thousands of bottles of unlabeled wine that Robert Fapoli could put his winery's name on and sell to China. So this went on and the two men became friends. Everything seemed fine until one day uh, Dahl approached him and said, you know, we really should start our own winery. We should buy a vineyard. We should start our own winery where you can make the wines that you can sell to the Chinese. Dahl said, I'll help find the financial backers. He brought in a famous Hollywood director named Jonathan Kesselman. Jonathan Kesselman was used to raising money in Hollywood for films he wanted to make. Brought in an investor named Imad Toffolis. Imad Toffolis. That's going to be an important name. Remember that. And basically all these people had the dream of coming to Napa and entering the wine business. And the business prospered. Prospered so well that Dahl was able to repay the first 10% of his investment. Everything seemed to be going great. The next year, Dahl opened a craft beer brewery right in downtown Napa, something that everybody thought was an insanely crazy idea, but it seemed to be hugely successful. But Dominique Fapoli, who was running the winery while Dahl ran the books, had a lingering problem. They were selling tons of wine, they were making amazing wine, but somehow the winery always seemed to be short on money. One day, Fapoli got a phone call from their lender telling him they were foreclosing on the vineyard. They hadn't paid their mortgage for more than six months. Well, when other investors checked, they soon discovered that Dahl had not been making beer at the Napa Valley Brewery he founded. He was actually just buying kegs of beer from other breweries, and all of the fancy tanks and equipment were all just a facade. And before you knew it, the entire empire came toppling down. Dozens and dozens of people sued Dahl, claiming they owed him money. Litigation was rampant in the Napa Valley courthouse. Um, uh, one of uh, Tafalis finally hired a retired FBI agent who actually found out that Dahl was a convicted felon. He'd twice been convicted of fraud when he lived in Minnesota, which technically made him ineligible to own a wine business. You can't own a wine business in the United States if you are a convicted felon. Um, and just when it seemed like this litigation was going to bleed everybody dry and nobody was ever going to see any money, Robert Dahl's attorneys called up the attorneys for um, the investors and said that Robert wanted to settle the cases. Robert had found some money. He wanted to pay Mr. Tafalis off to settle the case. The lawyers had a very detailed deal that they had negotiated, but said that Dahl wanted to come and do the signing in person at the vineyard as sort of one last ode to the land and, and the dream that they had created together. The lawyers felt that it might be best if the two men just met by themselves. This was Dahl's request. They thought it made sense that they had finally sort of ended this acrimonious years-long litigation. And sure enough, the two men, Tafalis and Dahl, met at the vineyard. The lawyers were on a conference call. For about half an hour, they had a relatively civil, calm business meeting. Dahl's lawyers explained the terms that they were offering. Um, to Phyllis's off, uh, lawyers said that that was something that he was willing to accept. And just when it seemed that they were ready to sign a deal, Dahl blurted out, screw the lawyers, I'm not willing to pay that much. 
you know, forget it. Well, the lawyers frantically tried to save the deal. Um, it was agreed that the lawyers would drop off the conference call for about half an hour while the two men tried to hash out their differences and see if they could find a different formula that worked for both of them. The phone line goes dead. Dahl and Tophilis are there in person. It's eerily calm. And then suddenly, without warning, Dahl pulls out a gun and starts firing at Tophilis. Tophilis goes tumbling out of his chair. He's shot, but only wounded. He crashes through the door. He starts running through the vineyard. Tophilis is a much more fit man, so he's actually able to slowly get away as Dahl is shooting after him, firing, pop, 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 pop. Tophilis gets on his cell phone. He dials 911, screams for help, says that Dahl is in the vineyard chasing him, trying to shoot him. When Dahl realizes that he's never going to catch him, he runs back to the winery, gets his car, and drives his car out into the vineyard. Tophilus is still running frantically on the phone with the sheriffs. He can now hear the sirens coming. There's another burst of gunfire. Tophilus ducks, hides behind a trench in the vines. Miraculously, he's not hit. He runs again. He can now see the flashing red lights of the police coming. And just as the police car pulls to the edge of the vineyard, just a mere 20 yards away from where the two men are, Dahl catches up to him and shoots him right between the eyes. Stands up straight and calmly, looks at the police officers, calmly walks back to his car, and shoots himself in the head. Ending the story of one of the greatest crimes that's ever happened in the Napa Valley. Um, truly a true tragedy, a bad life choice that turned bad for both of them. Um, this one has not yet been turned into a book. It was a 48 hours uh, mystery on television. You can probably find the uh, the episode if you search through on um, Hulu or one of the online streaming services. I really hope that, uh, that you enjoyed our talk today. Again, if you want to buy our wines, breckwinery.com. Use free ship as the code to get free shipping. Um, thank you for all the nice comments that uh, people put about Scout. I just noticed that. Um, and uh, really appreciate everybody tuning in today. So this is great. We'll do it again next Friday. Join for uh, Carolyn's talk on Australian wine and uh, cheers to you all. Thank you very, very much. Have a great evening, everybody. Stay safe.